Welcome to our Compose Cast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well. I just drank one of those seltzers, so we're going to see how this episode goes, but... I, I think I'll be able uh, to uh, keep everything in. So <laughs> I can cut out anything that's necessary in post. That's that's the beauty of doing it not live. Hey, yeah, but uh, no, you're getting into Twitch though. I heard. I, I was thinking, maybe, you know, what? If, what? Hey, where's we could start streaming these things? Maybe one day. I, I don't know. I was uh, I had attended a Jupiter Broadcasting uh, recording session. Uh, over Twitch, which was nice. Uh, what I liked is they actually streamed on their their stream, not themselves, but their IRC channel. And they were displaying that and commenting on that as they went through the uh, the recording. So that was fun. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. That's So they had IRC up on, as a side-loaded chat kind of deal as opposed to, I guess, whatever the default is. Exactly. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah, I'm excited about today's show, though. I know you are too. I know you're absolutely ready for it. I've got a couple of rants. Okay. All right. One, I just wanted to, so I know you're, you're on your way over, uh, this weekend. Uh, at, at least I did want to say that I did get my car back. Uh, so that's okay. All right. That's good. I got that. The, the, the cool thing was, I mean, I had, I'd never dealt with this auto shop before. I, I really didn't have one in the area and I, Literally, after talking with them over the phone, kind of kind of dropped the, the keys off one morning and, and just let them do their thing. And I got a call from the owner who was working on the car. And he was just incredible to talk to. Like he was he was on point. He knew what he was talking about. And uh, it was it was just so refreshing to have that kind of communication with him as he's dealing with something that it, I paid literally thousands of dollars for. Right? right. So he was he was like super respectful about it. And, uh, you know, even without prompting, gave me all the information I could possibly want and, and made sure I was understanding it uh, as I walked along. And, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking through this. You were, you were talking about me going through Twitch. Right. And and I have been. Um, and I've been going through a lot because you know, a lot of the times there's just not anything worth watching on there. <laughs> Usually I stick to the uh, just talking or the music or the talk shows and, and podcast channels. It's I mean, it's it's almost like people feel entitled to be listened to, which I mean, to be fair, is kind of our angle. But still. <laughs> Oh man, <laughs> there are there are few people who who actually are able to to have a personality, all right? And that personality comes out, and and they're able to express that. And and it really, all the all it, that I'm looking for is that personality to 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 be able to watch that and consume that, and 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 you know be be around that, make something entertaining, right? I uh, found a lot of DJs uh, can can go one side or the other where you know you don't you don't even hear from them and like dude I don't care about your music or on the other side someone's really engaged with the chat or um, really into the background of the music and, and really giving you the backstory and the history and just gushing about something man I, I don't care what you are just be passionate about something and uh, so so coming coming full circle you know I was it was it was good to get my car back it sucked that I had to pay you know as much as I did to get it fixed sure in the end, I was okay with it because I knew that the, the 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 owner, you know, respected you know my investment, and he respected me enough to take his time and 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 gush to me about his passion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know that was that was just today. I was I was uh, dealing with that. Oh, so that's fairly recent then that you got mm -hmm. your car back then. All right, yeah. how about that? Yeah. yeah, I was expecting you to say like, uh, you know, I got it back a couple of days ago. That, that's. Well, I made the mistake of letting them know, hey, I actually do have, you know, one of my buddy's car and he doesn't need it. He's, you know, off in boot camp oh, right no. now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So they're like, oh, we'll get it to you after the new year, you know, <laughs> a week later. <laughs> and before I got the car, um, I, I was obviously stuck in here. So I've been doing some, some stuff in run deck and just absolutely banging my head against the wall. Are you using run deck for something you shouldn't be using it for? That's immediately where my mind jump is. You're just ex overextending these tools to do something where it's like, eh, is it supposed to do that? Well, <laughs> to be fair, it was my fault. Okay. All right. <laughs> I did not read the provided documentation. So 
and and I and I did link them in the show notes uh, today because I, I wanted to, I wanted to go through this more than any other Python thing that I found this week because you know <laughs> I like that. But I, I I did link the the actual documentation to Rundac in the in the show notes, talking about how do you quote arguments to steps. So in in Rundac we run a series of steps, and those steps are of a certain type. And the type that they're talking about here is a command script, right? It's it's basically anything you would throw on the CLI, right? So you can you can run any kind of command. I actually use it to craft our Ansible playbook invocations, and it's just an easy way to craft it exactly how I want it with with different variables and stuff. There are probably two better ways to do this. Rundeck has a built-in Ansible module, but I'm calling it from a special place with with I want it to be in a certain directory when I call it yada yada yada. Right. And right. and I haven't taken the time to set that up. Uh, otherwise, I could also write my own plugin, I believe like in Python for Rundeck. Yeah, for Rundeck and just call that with the requisite arguments, right? And not have to worry about because everything would be done behind the scenes with sure, my Python right, script. Right. But I am just lazy enough to uh, use the provided oh, command <laughs> and and simply use that. Now where where it comes in tricky is Ansible has a way to to ingest extra args uh, to any playbook run, which is a key equals value space separated string. Now, if you pass that out on the command line, obviously you have to quote it because it's space separated. You can't have a space and have it considered one argument. So right. you would you would pass the dash E flag and then you would quote the space separated key equals value. You could have three, four, five, however many values you want, right? Well, I go to try to pass this into to run deck and it's interpreting them as different variables and, and just throwing all kinds of different errors. And it's, it, it's not like an at all. Uh, and, and actually that is why you were running into that issue uh, the other day about the user admin password not being set. Right. Cause it, yeah, it wasn't, yep. it wasn't ingesting that variable correctly. And I'm sitting here scratching my head. Like, I don't know what's going on. So what was it? The space was it being tossed as an extra argument basically, instead of being as one as a, you know, key value. Exactly. Exactly. Man. So, so you know, to, to read from the docs here, uh, it says when you define a command or arguments to any script or job reference step, your arguments are interpreted as a space separated sequence of strings. If you need to use spaces or quotes within the argument, here are some rules for quoting arguments. <laughs> the rules that I found out three and a half hours later. After, right. I couldn't tell you how many different like XARGs and echo dash N and like little bash tricks that I've picked up over the years to try to format stuff. None of them work. None of them were working. So I, I, I was like, all right, all right. If I can't build this string manually, there's gotta be something cause I can't be the only person to do this. Right. So uh, I was taking a look here and to, to drop down to the, the last uh, example here to actually pass double quotes, right? Or single quotes to, to pass quotes to the command, like raw, like the, the, the out itself, you actually have to triple quote. And that escapes the quote being interpreted as a space separated set of strings. I'm just sitting here like, not mad, not angry because it's over. Wish I would have known. Wish I would have known. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh man. Okay. 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 So you're just going triple quoting it out. I'm triple quoting it up over here. That was a, a, a fun way to find that out. A tricky fix there, but <laughs> found nonetheless in the documentation. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Where I should have gone in the first place. Go figure. Oh, unfortunately, uh, that's uh, that's how it is, isn't it? Happy to make that work, and uh, you know, slow but steady progress towards towards making stuff better. I I do have some official news here like news that isn't just me ranting but i did see that uh dan brown the uh author and maintainer of bookstack put out a blog post and have you been able to take a look at this one uh, i was looking at it i was looking at who they replaced for mailchimp was what i was most mm. interested because that's who we use right now but who are they replacing for google analytics yeah so so google a analytics has been the software that 
that Dan Brown has been using to track visitors to the Bookstack app website, which is the main website for, for the Bookstack application that we host. And he says, I have been using Google Analytics to track visitor metrics. Um, while not crucial to know, it's generally useful to have an idea of the target audience, current popularity, and be aware of any visitor spikes. For the email updates and email security alerts, I've been using MailChimp. This post explains the move to more privacy-aware alternatives. So that being the case, uh, what he did, and he goes over you know, what Google Analytics are, how they work, how it sends information off to Google, anonymized or not, sure. it's still sending stuff off to a third party. Sure. And not something we'd, we'd like. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm having flashbacks to our Firefly 3 discussion, right, where we were talking about responsible logging of metrics and, and how to, right, to get analytics in, in an ethical manner. And, right. and apparently this has been something that, you know, has is, is been bugging him, and, and he decided to take some steps uh, to, to change. So he set up uh, a self-hosted instance of Plausible. It looks like it answers the questions he needs. I, I, he has it right here. How many visitors are on my site? How many visitors have been on my site? You know, where have they come from? What pages are being viewed? What country are they visiting from? What devices are being used? And what traffic? When when does trap? When does the traffic spike occur? When does the traffic spike occur? Which, I mean, I don't know what else Google Analytics provides. I feel like that answers all the major questions though that are out there. Now, I didn't know Plausible was out there. I've I've had heard of uh, Matomo, M A T O M O. Yes. as another alternative that's out there and they have actually like a nice little mobile app and that does almost same thing as google analytics i guess it just sends off and it, it answers those it answers those key questions that are you know who's on my site and where are they from kind of deal and what what are they using exactly and and one of the things you know and this is this some very simple stuff he's looking to to gather here uh, and and he did say that he he's chosen to self-host a service to keep costs minimal rather than opting into their paid hosted plans, uh, and and that's interesting in itself because you know that it's it's also keeping his data right within within his own control, um, and and I was thinking right so so this is a way for plausible to monetize right obviously they're going to have people who are looking to get analytics uh and and they're going to want to monetize their content somehow right their their application because we live in a society you're going to have to monetize it somehow even admitting it though and and he does he does talk about it uh, he said he still wants to support the project via their github sponsors page right so it looks like the the plausible application is looking to to donors as well as offering their their paid hosted plans. Now, one of the things, and and I got this from from Jason Stapleton, is that relying on donations is is all right when you're you're getting going. Um, it it almost doesn't feel ethical because I know I know you're 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 giving giving us a, a service right. You're you're putting out the code, but there's there's no actual transaction. And and it can cheapen the product when a when a donation is the only thing that's made to support it. Even canonical uh, makers of Ubuntu have support contracts because they want to provide that service. And it ultimately does end up being a a service based economy or the gig based economy, as a lot of people have been talking about, where you're looking to be able to provide something to to other people. And a lot of the times, it isn't software because software can be very disappointing, right? But what you can <laughs> offer and what can what can set you apart from the pack is your your service that you're able to provide. Not not just right. you know not just the results, but the 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 care and feeding of relationships, right? Of your you know your interactions, your follow ups, you know everything that you do to make people feel important. I mean, going back to what I was talking about earlier today, the the auto mechanic made me feel important. He made me feel valued. He you know he. He made me feel like I was a, a partner with him. I was I was in business with. I, we were we were going down this together. We were discovering as we were going what was going on and, and making these decisions together. And and that's the kind of service that I think everyone's looking for in 2021. That's what people expect to see. Right. Right. Yeah. But yeah, people they want to go on that discovery journey with you. 
I think yeah. is kind of the expectation anymore. They don't just want to be handed it and said, all right, good luck. Here you go. It's a, uh, all right, well, let's do this kind of together and let's get you set up this way. Yeah. They, they, uh, I, I don't want to walk into a body shop and he say, uh, yeah, fix, fix the three things for you. Right. And I was like, well, that's useless. Well, what was broken? Right. What can I do to prevent this? You know, is, is it, is that going to cause something else on the road? You know, where it's, it's a conversation to have. It's, it's not a prescription, right? It's not a, you know, it's, it, it's not foretold. It needs to be something that you're, you're discovering and you're, you're communicating together. Open source software is open source for a reason and, and uh, self-hosting, right, is, is absolutely a way to go. It's, it's a way I've gone for a long time, right? And I'm hoping that I can be that for other people. When, when people are looking for these types of solutions, whether it be Canboard, whether it be Rundeck, and they're looking for someone to come along that journey with them because it's, it's hard to switch up your workflow. It's, right. it's very difficult. And being, with someone who's done it before and, and being with someone who, who knows the pitfalls and can help guide you, a, a journeyman, if you will, is going to be a lot more reassuring and, and, you're, and a lot easier on everyone's mental health uh, than going it alone. Even though Dan Brown <laughs> did not go the, the hosted route, it, which is totally his, his purview, uh, he, he did have something in the line of transparency that I thought was interesting. Just a little, like a little two paragraph snippet right here at the very end. He said, one of the favorite features of plausible is that it's really easy to make the dashboard public, which is something I've often wanted to do with Google analytics in the interest of transparency. The book stack dashboard can be seen at the link he threw into the blog there. So, so actually opening that up shows the metrics themselves. I mean, it's, it's a full public metrics. Everything is exposed there and you, you can, you can track what's going on, see how many page views have been counted and, and, and everything of that sort. I just think that is, that is really cool as far as transparency goes. Not only that, but we were, we were talking about uh, what you and I want to do with analytics, right? And, and one of my main pushes is, Hey, you, whatever analytics that we think are worth gathering, right, are not just worth gathering for ourselves, but on every instance as well, right? If, if right. I'm concerned about what pages are being viewed or, or how often or when, that is right up the alley of, of whoever's using that instance would be concerned about that as well. And then you can make even more well-informed decisions based on that, just in, in the sense of transparency and, and not just in the, you know, because I'm a good person kind of way. It's like, because this is going to benefit everyone kind of way. Um, so that's, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to see not only is he able to switch away from a proprietary platform, but he's also able to increase his own transparency with his clientele. And, and I, I don't see how that would do him anything but good at this point. Anyways, I, I was actually very interested in his MailChimp section as well, because I know personally we do use it. MailChimp, right, yeah. And he had as well. Yeah, I saw he, so I guess he moved over to Mailbag there. So Mailbag, he said that with some extra Christmas holiday time, I put together my own app, which I called Mailbag. Okay, how about that? Yeah, so this is something. So he built his own. Yes. Yes. Um, and just to read off the rest, he said, this is a purposefully very simple app and has lots of limitations, but it does what I need while providing me an opportunity to work on something fresh for a change to sharpen some development skills. Always good to hear that. Always good to hear someone trying to push the envelope. A couple of things that he pointed out, there's no open or click tracking support, and there's also no HTML email support. All right. So okay. talk about bare bones, right? He, he <laughs> I would say just threw this together as, as quick as he could, but it's, it's interesting to see. Uh, but, but he did point out some uh, pitfalls with MailChimp specifically in this blog post. It looked like the two he had there, which I think are great points. It's another entity that registrants would have to trust in addition to myself and Bookstack, And they added link tracking, even when choosing to disable it. Very interesting because it looks like he pays for the version that 
you can disable tracking. And I like the comment he has. He says, it appears that user privacy may be a paid feature. Mm. So it sounds like they have it on by default. They're collecting data even when you request not to. How about that? Yeah, that's not that's not good. That's not cool. It looks ugly. Uh, the <laughs> the clicks. I mean, how many how many times have you been in a security training and they said, "Hey, hover over the link to make sure it's taking you to the correct place," and you hover over it and it's a you know, manage.com domain. Like what what even is that? Where Listmanage.com. Right? Come on. So yeah, it appears that user privacy may be a paid feature. I guess they got to make their money somehow too. <laughs> I guess, I I don't know. I don't know what my comments are on it cuz I guess, you know. Well, okay, so what's what's your thoughts on click tracking then? First party or third? What are your thoughts on click tracking? I don't like it. You don't like first or third party? If service per service has information on me that I allow for them, you know, I say, all right, yeah, you can have it. Um, I'm fine with it. Oh, you know, it's like getting back to Firefly. 3, it's like an opt-in telemetry. It's like, if you want it, man, you can have it. But, you know, I want to make sure this isn't going somewhere it's not supposed to be. Uh, did you look at any of these alternatives that he was talking about? Mail coach, PSP list, list monk. I'm sure there are plenty of alternatives out there, right? If If we were to say, hey, you know what, we want to go down the same route. And we went with one of these services. Say, say we even went with a self-hosted service. Would you include click tracking on that? No, honestly. Yeah? Would you? It goes back to the discussion on metrics. Like, metrics are valuable. If we have everything linked. If if we had run if we run a self hosted service that is a, a click tracker right and we can we can generate these these emails that link back to the the redirect right is that something that we implement on our own compositional dot enterprises domain? It's a good question to ask. Obviously, the one side is you want to be transparent in when you're where you're sending people right and right. and you want to. You want to kind of be upfront with people and, and you absolutely don't want to send people to a, to a separate service. But imagine if you had something like a plausible for email sending, right? Where you can, you can track clicks because they're getting sent to your domain and redirected. And that one tr- click is unique and can be tracked. Taking and stuff, a, yeah. Right, 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 right. That would start to answer some of the questions that he brought up earlier. Like, that what what is the corollary for how many visitors are on my site for email, right? You could you could talk about you know how many click throughs are there, where are people going? Are they going? Are they clicking on our news articles? Are they clicking directly to the site? Like what what sure. are people interested in, and how can I give them more of that for value? Because we were we were talking about this maybe in the the second episode. I mean, or far, the the Firefly three episode. We were talking about the the only alternative, right? is to send out a you would send out a poll or, or or a survey and that's obviously going to be biased because you're it, it's not tracking behavior right it's tracking perceived responses or you know best best case scenario or or what i like to perceive myself as as doing not what i actually do which trust me are are, are different things a lot of the time is it worth grabbing those kind of metrics and and how at what cost I think it's because of the way everything's been done with email. I just, in general, do not like uh, link redirects and email tracking at all. I, I just think it's kind of shady. I think it's kind of like, uh, all right, you, so you need to, you know, you're going to follow me through. And granted, I, I think it's just from not specifically small open source services, but I think that's what everyone is doing. I think it's just... Every email, if I click a link, I know someone's wa- I know someone's watching me click that link, and I just don't know if I, I I just can't come to terms with it. I don't like it. It's it's definitely more blatant than anything else. Yeah, no, I don't I don't know either. I just I just wanted to to bounce that back and forth with you. I I, I think metrics metrics are an incredibly interesting area of discussion ethically. Totally, because you can collect anything now, anymore. Yeah, and and even you 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 were talking about it. You know, you've just gotten turned off to metrics at this point. I mean, it it, it you know it's something in your gut at, at at some point just says, "Nah, I don't I don't like this." 
to it, something shady about this. You don't, do you really need all this information on me right now? And, and I think that's where I come back to the whole transactional aspect of it, right? If you're talking about where you're getting your information from, right? If, if I have a relationship with you, it's not me having to, to track you through these links, right? I can, I can reach out or, or, you know, I'm getting feedback from you saying, Hey, I'm loving all the links you send out, keep doing that. Right. Or, or, Hey, maybe not so long of an email, you know, or, or whatever I can, right. I can get, I can get that feedback if I have a relationship with you, if I don't have a relationship with you or, or, you know, if we haven't started to build some kind of trust, you're, you're not going to feel comfortable at all, especially if it's some faceless, you know, voiceless entity. Having the information is important. How you get it is important. Right. <laughs> How do you marry the two? I don't know. It's I don't good... <laughs> know. I think I've beaten that horse to death. And I think that had always been like controversial point that uh, MailChimp tracking feature that they have. Feature. Yeah. With air quotes. Yeah, right. Because right, this right. is a podcast. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, default updates here in Archipose developments. You want to take this one? Yep. Yeah. I'm just going to uh, run through a couple of updates here. We are going to be rolling out our monthly uh, updates. So I was taking a look at uh, different services that uh, are looking at a version bump. Uh, and I just have three listed here. I think we've gone over most of these. Uh, Camboard being the only one I really wanted to hit on is I believe we've covered uh, Bitwarden and uh, WordPress, their relevant yeah. releases. It's just that now they have subsequent releases, so we're, we're staying our, our stable uh, one minor version behind, uh, and those are getting upgraded. Camboard, however, is a different story. So 1.2.17 was released about 10 days ago, and then about nine days ago, 1.2.18 was released. Uh, and and, and I, this is why we do this, right? Be, because we don't want to be on the bleeding edge and, and you know cut ourselves. If implementations were using uh, SQLite for the database back end, we use MySQL, so this doesn't affect us whatsoever. But for, for those who used SQLite, uh, they f- faced a potential data loss because of Ooh. different things with, with uh, database foreign keys being disabled inside different uh, database migrations and, and transactions. These things happen, right? Um, and, and like I said, less than a day later, they released a, a new version. They have all types of warnings uh, on everything here to, to make sure to skip the version. If uh, you using are SQLite. using SQLite, right? They've, yep. they've, They've said you can jump directly to the, the newer version. Um, I'm just going to stick on here uh, for the time being. I mean, there's there's no real need for us to, to, to skip this. Everything's going to be included. Uh, so we are just going to to roll that up uh, and then wait for 1.2.19 to get released and and keep following that that one minor version. I, I do kind of feel bad because, what was it, last uh, one, of the, one of the previous episodes we were talking about how, you know, stable and secure... <laughs> Camboard Camboard is is. (laughs) never had an issue upgraded or whatever. And these things happen though. So I'm I'm glad to see that they owned it. And and honestly, the next day, the next day. It's out immediately. Yeah. So good to see that. And and we'll continue to watch that. And then we have our compose developments, which I'm just going to breeze right into the, the one we have actually is uh, variableizing Ansible's no log parameters for tasks. Um, and this was something I, when developing software, and I think we touched on this last episode too, right? People tend to throw in, you know, test password, you know, and, and just these little sure. shortcuts to, you Solar know, places. one, two, three. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and, and it helps for development. It, it's actually necessary for development just because otherwise you're going to spend, you know, way more cycles than you need to just figuring out what's wrong, what's going on. One of the things that we do with Ansible is that there is sensitive output every now and then, and we need a way to censor that. Like we don't want to spill the database password in plain text in our logs that when we're running migrations. Right. Right. So we, we unfortunately don't have a way to just redact that specific password. We no log the entire task. So we always see is a, a, a successful or, or unsuccessful and a this output has been redacted. Uh, however, if you know, a database migration fails, all I see is that this task failed and I have no 
any kind of log or output or anything to, to go by. So I'm kind of flying by my, the seat of my pants at that point. So what we've done is made no log into a variable. And I, I, I was thinking of all different types of weird ways to, to implement this where we could, we could turn this on and off and, you know, get rid of it or, or keep it on for development purposes. And it turns out we can just variableize it like literally everything else. I even link to the, the Reddit post cause it was, it was in my Canboard task. I had, I'd plopped it in the external links field there. This is pretty much as simple as it gets. I don't know. I didn't think about this an hour ago, but it's, I was even on the cusp of like messaging the, the guy, the poster and saying, Hey, you know what did, uh, did that come back to bite you in the butt at all? Or? <laughs> <laughs> kind of explain a little here. It defaults to true, right? Or it defaults to false, and then you have to enable it true for each task. Oh yeah, no, I'm 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 hev- heavily leaning into these double negatives here. So <laughs> if we no log true, it censors. You could almost call no log a censor. Censor true, right? Right. Um, and then we would have to override it on a particular run to say censor false right so we would when doing development work when we're running from our automation front end from run deck we would have to explicitly pass no log equals false right so right. To, to make sure it did not censor the output because i know it's going to fail right probably at that point i've already tested it once and gotten a failure in, in a place where i can't see that output and then I got to go back and, 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 and revert it and then try that again uh, with that no log turned off so that I can see what's going on with that. Obviously, that's not something we do with production instances. That's operational security at that point. Um, probably this is going to be more so for development, development purposes. Right. Yeah, especially right. when, you know, your database migrations go sideways or whatever, Jack. You know, it's, it's not always your database migrations. Tossing me just completely under the bus but not wrong nonetheless <laughs> the the couple times I, I and and honestly i've been surprised the amount of times i've been able to work around it a, a, as well and it's it's usually just something as simple as i have a permissions error that i can log in and, and double check or you know i didn't follow the process correctly so i gotta go back and do it again the right way so um yeah, you should usually usually it's no big deal, but I'm glad at least we have that to handle those kinds of errors, right? And and that's in the, the public repo, so anyone who who does end up using that role has that functionality as well. All right, so this week we have uh, Canboard. This week for our integration discussion, we have getting into advanced customization. I think specifically we're going to talk about automatic actions and. Re- recurring tasks yeah yeah so i was actually just looking at the book stack notes and we got a lot on there i yeah i think i'm most excited to get in the concepts more than anything uh because i think it is hard to explain the uh setting up reoccurrence i think more of a why for what we're going to go over but i'm excited uh to talk about recurring tasks and automated actions that's the word i was looking for earlier yeah, I, I didn't know whether to call it reoccurring or recurring. Like, I, I don't know the difference. So so the two are kind of like interspersed all throughout the documentation here. I'm going to use them as, as the same word. Interchangeable, words. sure. It, so so <laughs> if if I get it wrong, please give me some give me some leeway here and, and let me know later. <laughs> to start off with, I, I, I wanted to, to broach the concept, giving some real world examples. So what's going on here? Well, we think about things like uh, laundry, team meetings, or, or, or even workouts. All of these things, and, and many more, happen over and over again on a predictable schedule. And unlike habits, like drinking water every day, it's preferable to get reminders about these type of things. But I don't want them to clutter up my board until it's actually time to do them. So now what? And, and that's kind of the question I want to answer with this documentation is, is the, all right, now what? I, I know these things are going to be happening over and over again. I don't want them to clutter up my board. I definitely don't want to create new ones once a week for like laundry or workouts. What do we do about it? Well, there, as the title says, 
are reoccurring tasks and automated actions in Kanboard. So I'm gonna I'm gonna touch on reoccurring tasks first. And of course, I'm gonna link you directly to the Kanboard documentation. Nothing's yep. gonna beat that. Just to go over real quickly what the reoccurring tasks have, on every task detail page, you can choose to edit the reoccurrence. So if we if we take a look at the edit recurrence page, uh, it, it gives us a, a couple of options. One of the main ones is gonna be the trigger. 90% of the time, this is gonna be when the task is moved to the last column. Uh, Jack and I obviously have sure. gone over, have done as the, the final column. So we basically take a, a task, move it from left to right. When it's in the far right column, it's quote unquote done. And then at that point is when my recurrent task would trigger 90% of the time, like I said. There are also other instances like trigger something when it moves from the first column or trigger it when the actual task is closed. Now, I can understand triggering something when the, the task itself is closed, but triggering specifically a recurrence when the task moves from the first column is interesting to me because I, I don't necessarily know that I see a use case for that or have been able to to come up with one. So Jack, I was wondering if, you know, what would you what would you think about if I said, you know, I I want to take this thing and immediately have a new one populate as soon as I move it out of the first column. As soon as I take it and actually do something with it, I want a brand new one populate. Uh, that that's ready for me to work as well. Uh, that's a good question. I I can't think of anything right now off the top of my head only because it doesn't seem very Kanban-ish to have something generate after it's moved out of that first column. You'd want, you'd want it to be done before you regenerate the next one. Because Kanban would track stock of things, right? And, and that's initially what it was used for. It was, it was sure. used as a, a card type system to to track, all right, we're getting low on these types of cards, so we, we need to order the more of these types of material because that's what those cards represent. And then as the material comes in, they they add more of the card representation to the, to the workflow. Now, I could see something like order fulfillment using this, and, and you have a, a templated order ticket or, or, or task where you you would grab it, move it into you know the the next column, and fill out all the details of the customer, and then immediately a brand new one of that same template would be generated yeah. for you to use in the event of a, another customer. Uh, that's that's going to be for a lot of physical good things, and 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 that would be a good way to to deal with templates as a as a workflow kind of thing. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Maybe not so much. Honestly, honestly, templates aren't aren't a bad way to go about it. I I think most of my recurring tasks tend to end up fairly cyclic in the sense that once they're done, I'm ready for a new one. The to, next one. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm ready for the next one. Um, whereas you know, if you have a variable length of things, but you can always take another order for something, you always want to have that template available for just you. ready for you, right? So that was my thought on that. But like I said, for, for at least our use case, 90% of the time, it's going to be when the task is actually moved to the last column. Um, now, one of, one of the things is if you move it to the last column and then move it back and then move it to the last column again, it's not going to trigger twice. Uh, it keeps track of the parent task state. So it, it knows that this task is already generated a recurring task. So we're not going to generate another one. I've run into that a couple times and, and had to scratch my head because I couldn't really remember how that worked. Then I had to go back and find the child task, but it does not generate a new one if that's a second time putting it into that done column. Another section on that edit recurrence screen is the factor and timeline box. Uh, and that is to calculate at what point is a recurrence going to happen. Uh, specifically for the due date. So this will set like when the due date is for that task, which if we think about it in orders being taken, doesn't make much sense. But if we think of it as, you know, a weekly task that makes absolute sense. So what it would do is it would calculate either in days, months, or years, the number of those that you would want your due date to be extended by. And then that base date next to it 
would give you uh, how to calculate the new due date. Is it from the time that you put it into the last column or is it from the existing due date? And and there are a couple of right. reasons why you would you would go one or the other. For instance, if it's going to be like laundry or, or garbage, right, and, and the time it needs to get done is based off of when it was last done, uh, then you're going to calculate the due date from when it's moved into the last column. Because if I go on vacation for three weeks, I don't want to move it and then have immediately a task due two weeks ago because it was calculated based on the last right, due date. Right. I just did the garbage. I don't need to do it for another week. So set the due date for next week. Uh, but if it's like a scheduled meeting or a, a workout, we want to keep that date pegged by calculating from the existing due date. Uh, so that will give us a, a stable, uh, even if I forget like a day to move the, the task to done after I work out, it's not going to throw off my entire schedule. It's based off that previous task, right? You're not straining it out of water, basically. So so if we have these this concept of, of a recurring task, one of the things I've found is, is how do I put stuff that repeats on an odd or, or, or different cadence? What I wanted to do is, is to, to have something that recurred uh, the Monday and Friday of the first week and the Wednesday of the second week on a cycle. Right. And, and so if I think about it, if, if I take like, in this case, it was actually a, a workout schedule. If I take a workout, let's call it workout A, on Monday and Friday, and then next week, because I have a Monday, Wednesday, Friday cycle, and I take the B cadence workout on Wednesday the first week, and then Monday and Friday the second week, I'm getting that Monday, Wednesday, Friday, ABA, and then the second week is BAB, right? So, so you're getting a, a rotation to your workouts that is, is cyclical, but you can't specify every Monday and Friday on alternating weeks it sure. just doesn't look like that um, so what i was able to come up with is to to have to, to i was able to find the cycle that the task repeats at which in this case is every two weeks and make one that recurs at that interval at each of the start dates in between the first and last occurrence so if I take if I take that first week Monday and Friday start point and the second week Wednesday start point, by the time the next Monday rolls around in week three and I have a two week recurrent task, that first Monday's task is now due. And then the end of that week, the Friday's task is due and so on and so forth. So what ends up being three tasks with the same recurrence but different start dates actually looks to me for all intents and purposes like the same task on that repeatable schedule yeah that's clear as mud right so you have six tasks across two weeks right and they're on a repeatable schedule correct so okay i just wanted to clear that up so it's it's three tasks in week one and then three tasks in week two and you have those occurring on a two-week interval yeah okay yeah I think you were explaining this one to me uh, before, and I was still trying to wrap my head around how how this automation was working and how you got this to work. But now it's all coming together. Yeah, that's that's when I twisted my ankle and I had some downtime to figure out what I wanted to do. <laughs> how do I want to get these right? How do I want to get these? Uh, yeah, exactly. Automations right. And I was like, well, I know the schedule I want to do. I want to do a three week workout cadence with uh, ABAB workouts, and it it is almost tricking it into saying, hey, this is the Monday and this is this is the Monday task and this is the Friday task. But to me, I put the same description. I put the same title. I sure. put the, you know, yeah. everything's everything's the same. I'm kind of tricking myself. It looks like the same to me. So it works, works out just fine. Looks like it's someone on some crazy odd, you know, interval type thing, type uh, task recurrence. But really, it's just, no, this yeah. happens once every two weeks. So that being the case, right? I obviously want to not have to create those all the time. And, and that, that helps for the recurrence, but when they recur, they start off in the far left of your board system at whatever swim lane they were in before. That doesn't help me at all. If I'm monitoring the, you know, one of, one of the middle columns, one of the, one of the in execution columns. So I need something to move that there for me because I am just too darn lazy to do that myself. 
automated actions uh, are where I go in order to fulfill that. Automated actions, I, I, I wrote down here that this could be a potentially large section uh, just for the sheer amount of examples uh, that they have. I'm going to hop over to their official documentation and go through that uh, as far as, as establishing a baseline. And then I can put some, some use cases that we have behind the theory. They write, to minimize user interaction, Canboard supports automated actions. Each automated action is defined with these properties. An event to listen, the action linked to the event, and any additional parameters. Each project has a different set of automated actions. All the automatic actions are, are a combination of the action, the event, and any additional parameters for that specific combination. They have some available actions listed here. Uh, they have, let's see, automatic, automatically assigned a category based on the color of the task. Change the assignee based on a username. Change the color of the task when using a specific task link, like blocked or is blocked by. Close the task. Move the task to another project. Open a task. Or automatically update the start date. So there are just a plethora of things here that you can do. I, I, I find this to be probably the most powerful tool that Canboard offers. Even a little bit better than Search, if I'm being honest. And I, I've been very impressed with some of the examples even that they have. We specifically use uh, heavily different ways to, to move tasks around. We do do some of the color things, and that's, that's kind of fun just to make sure everything's the same. But there, there are two main things, I think, that benefit us more than anything. So the first one is that all recurring tasks are moved out of the backlog to pending until their due date and then are put into work in progress. So there's, there's a couple of actions there. When we were talking about all recurring tasks start off in the far left, in our case, in, in the backlog of the board that they're on. So we can target all of the tasks in the backlog and put them into pending if they have a due date within 14 days. And, and that's, the, that's the rule that we have set up. As, uh, Jack, uh, you've doubtless seen, all the, all the tasks for our meetings are impending before they get thrown into work in progress. Right. And that happens automatically. So on the day that we are having our meetings, they are in work in progress ready for us to take notes in and reference and, and whatnot. Um, and, and that happens because we have that automated action to not only put it into pending, but we also have an automatic action to the day that it's due, put it into work in progress. Um, and I actually have two tasks for that too, just because of the workflow that, that we're talking about. So our workflow obviously is to keep things in, in pending if it has a specific due date. If it's not something I can do right now, it's something I have to wait for a date to occur. Right. I, I throw it in our, our pending column. And obviously that's why on the date it was due, I wouldn't want to move it over to my work in progress column because I don't ignore my work in progress column. I do have a habit of ignoring my pending column. Uh, the other column, however, that I also touch on is the planning column or the, the planned column. And that is the one right before work in progress. And if there's a task in there that has a due date, it's probably because I have to do something before that date. That's usually why stuff is in the plan column. So if that due date comes around and I still haven't put it in work in progress, it will toss it in work in progress to make sure that I can go see it and say, hey, this due date, by the way, is tomorrow, so you might want to take a look at it. So there are there are two ways there that we indicate to ourselves whether a task is, is important, it has a due date, and throw it into work in progress for us. Yeah, that pending one is very useful, especially we have a ton of automation around those maintenance tests that we have, um, especially for the show. It's like, we're going to get ready to record one. It's like, well, it doesn't happen until this date. So we're going to do this. But my favorite is that it's almost as if the whole thing is automated. So 
when it moves from uh, work in progress or usually it's just work in progress to done to, to the last column, we have another one automatically created and pending with the due date set out two weeks from from the existing due date. Right, right. So basically, rather than having to go through and create all these tasks and move them all around, it's done for us. So we have we have it created for us. We get that pending. It goes back. It you know when it's hey it shows coming up this week. It'll automatically move itself to planned or work in progress and say hey this is you know coming up this week. And it's just almost like a perfect cycle there. It really is. Yeah. We really don't have to do much except move it from work in progress to done. Yeah. Yeah, uh, with with any notes or whatever we need to work on it with, and it's it's just it's fluid, right? It's it's automated. It's everything that I never want to have to deal with. Uh, and then and then the last one I did touch on, but tasks in the done column stay open for twenty days and then close themselves. Um, then this is fairly straightforward. Yeah. Um, now for us, we let the tasks hang out in the done column for twenty days and then have them close themselves because we don't want them cluttering up our done column after they become irrelevant. Since we have review meetings every two weeks, this gives us that time frame, plus a little leeway in case we get delayed. Uh, also, the, the default search right, ignores all closed tasks, so once they do get closed, we don't see them again. So the rationale there is we don't want to see them if they're irrelevant. And that handles that most of the time they are once they hit that done and you know they've been sitting out 20 days we've already reviewed them we we've already reviewed them and we're 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 done with them right and as we were talking about in the previous episode i mean if we need to go back and and look them up we can absolutely do that through a search right there right it's just our default view at at that point i don't want to see it because i got other things i need to see that are a lot more important So that was that was really all I had to cover on that. I mean, automated okay. actions, automated actions make my life just that much easier. And and there's so many different cool things you can do with with uh, larger groups and priorities and and colors and moving things and external actions and triggering emails. And there there's just there's a lot there that we just don't use because we're we're not, kind of bare bones when we right. we come to really needing to keep track of our work and this this does that for us yeah but we do our runners we have runners out there you know if you need that automation and that's where i thought you were going with this we offer that customization and that whatever your team needs or whatever you know you as an individual may need or we can help you getting these set up and you know get you in this kind of the same kind of workflow that we're in so with that incredibly short and I thought it was going to be longer. Talk. Done. Uh-oh. Let's let's roll right into grab bag here. I'm sure I'll tangent off Cool. with uh, what we've got today. But I also felt like I had another short one, which today we're going to talk about the, I guess, the five-stage model of adult skill acquisition. You know, with it being the new year, welcome to 2021, by the way, I thought, all right, what am I going to do this? You know, I'm setting up my resolutions. What am I going to do this year? What am I going to set up for myself? I was like, all right, well, maybe I could be a better learner. Who knows? I feel like I was looking at Dunning-Kruger, and I was on a couple forums, and I was looking, and I was like, all right. And, you know, everyone's posting there, this is how you be a better you in 2021 or whatever. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh, all this, you know, you just got to cut through all the crap kind of. And But I thought to myself, all right, well, how can I be a better learner? There's this advanced beginner concept that's out there. And I was actually, this is what I was really looking for is advanced beginner because I'm going to go over it here. There's really five sets of skill acquisition, if you want to call it, or knowledge um, that is described in the paper by Dreisen, I believe is his name. And he breaks down skill level into, into novice, advanced beginner, competent, proficient, and expert. And I thought to myself, all right, well, how can I become you know competent, proficient, expert in something and skip past this advanced beginner stage? Dreisen was a guy, wrote this paper in, I think, 1980. And he was talking about adult skill acquisition, fine. And he talks about uh, these things in the context of, quite literally, context. 
perspective, decision, and commitment. I think the easiest thing to do is walk through this table that he has. So based okay. on your skill level, you're going to be at different levels for each of these things. I'll listen to that, ladies and gentlemen. We have another table. Ah, yes. Perfect. <laughs> I'm going to describe this as best as possible. So you have the first row here, uh, which is skill level, context, perspective, decision, commitment. And then the first column is... Uh, so it's that skill level, you know, first one, it's skill level down as novice, advanced, beginner, competent, and proficient and expert. Basically, based on this table and how you exist within it is kind of how Dreisen defines where you are on this chart. So, okay. So he's breaking it up into context, perspective, decision, and commitment. Why those four? It's very much just how he breaks down skill level. I thought, all right, well, this, it makes it makes sense based on uh, how he explains it. But uh, just getting into it, so n novice is that first step, I guess. You always you're starting out as a novice. You have a reliance on process and recipes. You're basically handed. You have you, you have no experience with it. You have nothing. You're you know you're not intuitive on it. You're you're not familiar with it at all. It's brand new to you. You know, riding a bike, it's like reading a book on riding a bike. You've never done it before. You are literally reading a book on how to ride a bike. What is a, what is a bike? It's, you know, two wheels in a frame. The only thing you can blame is the process if something goes wrong. Yeah, I, I saw that. That was very interesting. So, like, like what, do you, what do you mean blame the process? You can only blame the book that taught you how to ride. You don't have any other outside experience at this point. What if the process said to you pedal backwards? You're like, this is dumb. This doesn't work. You just sit there and you go, all right, well, this is the book's problem because the book told me to pedal backwards. So you're very reliant on recipes at this point. Yeah. So, so taking a look at the paper here, uh, he's talking about, actually, they use car driver here, uh, talking about how to shift into second gear when the speedometer points to a certain number, right? But he right. says then, but merely following rules will produce poor results. If a car stalls, if one shifts too soon on a hill, or when the car is heavily loaded, you're, you're going to be like, well, you you told me to shift at, you know, 3,500 right. RPMs. Right. right. Why? Well, and, well, okay, now there's a hill. And I think that's where he's talking about, where, where he talks about the components or the context. The novice is context-free. They, ha they have no context. Right. It just... Pointing at the car example, it, I think it says when the speedometer hits 10, switch to second. Mm -hmm. Well, 3,500 drives, but yeah, sure. 3,500, sure. But they aren't aware of that situation, like you mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. They just say, all right, I was told to do this. When this happens, I've done it. It works. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, you know, And you get those scenarios. And that's when you kind of get into that advanced beginner because at that level, you say to, you say to the advanced beginner, all right, what happens? Why don't you switch it when you hear the engine kind of revving? And you add that context to it. You say, all right, well, you know, maybe you're not at 3,500, but you're on the hill and you hear your engine revving or whatever, and you switch up or switch down. And you have that context now that you've done it enough times where you're able to say, all right, I know what I'm, you know, I can do that. I know what I'm doing, essentially. But People fall in that trap. I'm telling you, that advanced beginner trap. I have heard of that, yes. This is what I was trying to decompose here. I had a second bullet. It said, many programmers and other knowledge workers never advance past that advanced beginner stage primarily because they never accept the emotional consequences for their decisions. Oof. And I think part of that third step, I guess from going from advanced beginner to competent, is that you start to choose perspective. And you say, all right, this happened. All right, I need to take, you know, not responsibility, but you're choosing to be a part of the failure, I think is what it comes down to. And and that's that's hard to own up to because you got to own up to something. You can't blame the process at that point. You can't say, well, it's someone else's fault that I didn't know. All right. Or, right. or, or even as an advanced beginner, you can, well, I didn't know because I've never been put in that situation before. Right. 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 And, and being competent and my mind always goes back to the uh, apprentice journeyman master 
yeah. stage, yeah. right? And and the the competence I think would would fall squarely in that journeyman stage and say, well, well, look, you know, it's it's okay to mess up in situations you haven't been in before, but you also have to realize that there was probably something in the back of your head that told you this was a bad idea, and to start right. listening to your because at that <laughs> point you have a little bit of intuition to it, right? If I'm writing an Ansible script and I I start to to do a lot of hacky things. I know they're hacky. In the back of my mind, something tells me, eh, this is kind of hacky. Yeah, right, right. I can choose to ignore that and then, you know, stub Fall my toe and, and, and blame the table. But it's like, look, I was walking into that in the first place. <laughs> I love it. That's a great. <laughs> I, I'm going to hold on to that one for a while, <laughs> forever, probably. Yeah. <laughs> I love that example that you threw out there, though. It's, you know, you're writing a hacky script in the back of your mind, you're saying, you know, I really shouldn't be doing this, but. Well, and that's that's where tech debt comes from. So if you're in knowledge work and you have a lot of advanced beginners working for you who aren't listening to that little conscience in their head, you know, you're you're going to get a lot of hacky one off things. And then you would wonder why you're spending three quarters of your day putting out fires. And it's like, well, because people aren't owning up to their fair share of the process. In that proficient stage, even more so, competence is just kind of saying all right, this is the situation and, you know, we're a part of it and we're owning it. But with that proficient, you're experienced with perspective. You're saying, you know, you're essentially saying, you know, that this hacky, hacky scripting and bad scripting or, you know, one offs that, you know, it might create tech debt here or there. But really, you get into the commitment. I think what changes between competence, proficiency and expert is that third level, which is um, commitment. So at competent, you have a detached understanding and decision making. Um, obviously, they're involved in the outcome. Proficient, you have the involved understanding. Fine. I think what I was trying to get at here is that being proficient in something, you have that experience perspective. You're involved in understanding what's going on, but maybe you're not making the decisions at this level. I might compare that to my relationship with Python right now. I am I am very proficient at Python. Um, I, I kind of know all the tools that are at my disposal, sure. but I am by no means writing new things into the language. I'm not proposing new changes because I, I am not an expert enough to determine the direction that the language needs to go in or, you know, missing features or, or, or anything like that. All I'm doing is I'm, I'm proficient at utilizing that, that tool. The I'm, common libraries and the libraries yeah. that are already out there for sure. Sure. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And I can but, I can hack together something pretty well, but I'm not going to say we need a new operator and we're going to call it the walrus operator. Like I had yeah. I had no hand in that, and uh, I'm I'm willing to sit down and learn it and and probably get a good grasp on it and probably use it a lot. But I I didn't come up with that. I'm not that kind of an expert. And that's where you get to that expert level is you know I think they're guiding direction. Uh, they're very involved with the process, very involved with kind of everything that's going on, if you ask me, and they're making the decisions, kind of deciding and guiding where, I guess, the project is going at this point. Why, why'd you why'd you throw this up here, having, having described it? Yeah, so the big thing is that it distinguishes you between these five steps here. And really to point out the two or three different levels between advanced beginner and expert. Because that's where a lot of people do find themselves is that advanced beginner stage. You just, it's very easy to cop out and say, you know what? I, I've done this before. I've done this a thousand times. I'm familiar with the process, but I'm still going to sit here and blame the process. You know, mm. I, I don't mm-hmm. have to, I don't have to own up to the perspective that, you know, maybe, maybe I need to look further into this or more into this. I can still sit there and not take ownership is what I even, might even say. And, and that's what I would kind of call it. And, and I think you kind of mentioned it with tech debt, which is perfect. Maybe you do write a hacky script and it goes into production and then it starts to f- fail or break. You can sit there and go, well, someone told me just to write it that way and they just needed it really quick. And you can point and say, well, they just needed something rushed out the door. You know, this isn't my fault that this is bad. But I think that where you get dive deeper into it is you get to that competent, proficient expert stage and you say, all right, well, look, I know you need this today or tomorrow. But what we're going to do is I, I can get it out there, but we need to immediately come back to this and develop you something within the week or within a certain time frame and get this right. So we don't have to fight that tech debt. Yeah. 
it's all about that ownership for sure because you're you're not only taking ownership of yourself it's you're taking ownership of your emotions i mean usually when i get when i get upset at, at, at something i'm using there's at least one aspect of that that i could have done better all right i am always just a little bit angry at myself too right uh, and and focusing on that is is going to be a lot more helpful than than just lashing out and anything else around you that you can get your hands on. Yeah, I, I really found it interesting. I don't know where they pulled this from the distribution of skill level, but it says novice is about twenty percent, advanced beginner is forty, competent thirty, proficient eight percent, and then expert two percent. So expert really is that level of pushing the envelope forward, making the decisions and. You're got you're almost guiding the community or guiding uh, who you're with at this point on where to go. Uh, there was also one more thing I wanted to point out, which I really liked. Before you assume that you're the expert, remember that you're probably an advanced beginner. That's a, <laughs> that's that? a great. Quote. Everyone assumes they're an expert. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> we got an expert for everything out there. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Well, and there's a missing part of that too, right? Because okay. Great. Remember that you're probably an advanced beginner. Therefore, what? So what if I what if I do realize that I'm an advanced beginner, right? What can I do to get out of there? Assuming that my goal is to get out of that stage. Take ownership at that point, I'd say. Yeah, no, that's 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 exactly where I was going. Because if once again, right, when whenever I get angry, there's there's gonna be that little thing of, well, I am I'm a little bit angry at myself because I could have done something a little bit better, right? And that is my antidote right to to staying at that advanced beginner stage because if i'm able to approach a problem and say oh i know everything at, uh, about this and, right. and you know i'm the i'm the expert at this and i even i can't figure it out phew, you know you're 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 screwed <laughs> right but if you approach it and say oh this failed uh i probably did something wrong let me double check and 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 try to figure it out you're not only going to have a lot more success working with other people, right? But you're also going to be able to to humble yourself enough to learn to move past that advanced beginner stage. Without that, I just, I don't think you can at all. Right, and that's where a lot of people find themselves. Yeah. They don't progress past it. My thought would be for for the, the part that I perceive to be missing would would be to ask yourself, all right, how do I take ownership of this? Right. You said it perfectly when you said, if I'm the expert at this and you got to kind of, I think it boils down to you have to humble yourself a little bit and say, all right, maybe I am doing this wrong or, you know, maybe I need, do need to look at this from another perspective or maybe I do need to take ownership of what's going on during this process. And even if you are the expert, you're not going to hurt anything to take that same stance. Right. Now, maybe you may waste a little time and, and that always, you know, is, is, is a hard pill to swallow to, to step back. And, and even if you are 100 percent right and, and you take uh, all the time to, to carefully guide someone else through the process and, and walk them through what you're working through. And it turns out that you were right all along and you did it just in the most humble, gracious way. It's still a chunk out of your life that you're not going to get back just to have won an argument. <laughs> and you have to realize, though, that that is the cost of being an expert, is that you, you're you not going to be gearing towards a, a different level, right? But you, you are now the expert and you have those kind of responsibilities. The last thing I want to touch on, I feel like I stumbled all the way through that table, but... The one thing I did want to touch on was the zero to expert uh, part that is on the show notes here. Uh, and he says, so zero to expert, obviously. And so it says, at this point, it's beneficial to focus on collecting recipes when you're at zero. If you only read about recipes, it's impossible to move past zero to the novice state. What are we thinking? Like cooking recipes or like meth recipes or like what kind of recipes? Oh, yeah, we're we thinking meth recipes. No, we're thinking I would call a recipe anything that gets you a step-by-step -step guide. I think a good one with Ansible would be, you know, they have a great getting started guide that says that, and I would call it a recipe per se for this is what you do in Ansible. This is how you, you know, install Ansible is like the first step. So, all right, you have it installed. Now I'm, you're going to run, I think it's Ansible 
you know, da at dash M ping, and then you're just going to ping your first host, which is usually local host. You're not doing anything crazy. You're not writing playbooks. You're not writing rules. You're quite literally running a ping module just to see if you can, you know, you might not even have open SSH server online at this yeah. point. So you're probably walking through and saying, all right, well, what do I need to get Ansible up and running? But zero to novice is collecting recipes and implying them. Huge step. You're just going to sit at zero if you don't apply them. Like applying them like riding the bike or applying them like executing the script or like actually doing the thing. Is that what you're talking about? Actually doing the thing, right? Sitting down and doing this. You can read about it all day, but if you don't okay. do it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm behind you there. You're not going to. Yeah. Right. You can sit there all day and read about Ansible, but that's just the theory, right? That's not the practice and getting to that expert stage. You have to practice. You have to do it essentially, but yeah. Okay. So zero to novice is collecting the recipes and applying them. You know, maybe someone wrote that wrote a guide on doing this. It's like, all right, well, I went out and did that. The novice to advanced beginner is breaking away from the fixed recipe and saying, all right, well, look, maybe, you, you know, you're adding that context. You're adding that situational context. All right. Well, for us, this is going to work this way instead of how this guy wrote, how he did it. So breaking away, like if I'm thinking cooking recipes, just to throw another random thing into sure, the mix. Sure, sure. Well, my, my roommate just cooked pork and uh, sauerkraut, basically, right? Um, sure, sure. Pork and, pork and some kind of coleslaw or something. Sure. And uh, I had just asked him. I was like, hey, did you uh, did you, did you you like the recipe? How did, how did it go? Uh, and he said, yeah, I, I liked it, but I was a little bit wary of cooking the pork medium rare. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, and he's like, you know what? Uh, I, I did it according to the, to the recipe, right? He's like, I, I cooked it medium rare and, uh, and, and tried it out. And at that point, sure. The, the outer bits were, were pretty good and like super tender and, 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 and nice, but like the inner parts of it, uh, weren't like cooked through all the way. Like I, I wanted them to be a little bit more, more well done. Uh, and then he's like, at that point, I actually did go ahead and put it back and, and cook it, cooked it a little bit longer yeah he's not taking his you know pork recipe and then like substituting like beef into it right he's like he's modifying the recipe in in subtle subtle ways according to what he perceives to be a a, a little bit better boost or a little bit better a little bit better something sure in I don't know. I, I think that's a great example of that cooking one. So I'm going to keep going with it. So like advanced beginner to competent stage is you're limiting data and concentrating focus on developing a better intuition. So, you know, as he develops that pork recipe, he's making these small changes, you know, maybe he starts cooking other stuff. He's just kind of getting a better understanding and intuition for everything that's going into these recipes at this point. Just to just to expand on that concept, like at, at what point is he like? What are the you know subtleties of the way I can cook pork? Right? Is for for instance, uh, he likes to sous vide a lot. He'll cook it sous vide, uh, and then uh, he was thinking about f next time finishing it off in like a uh, like on the on the grill or in a skillet or something to give it a little bit of a char because he knows that's that's a common way to cook pork. Pork is a as a concept can can get a char if you if you cook it correctly and it's it's pleasant that way right so he's bringing in his other knowledge of of pork as a pork, concept right. and saying i can apply it to this specific recipe not just adding more salt than the recipe calls for or adding a little bit different herbs saying i know i know this concept of pork goes good with this other concept of char that i have and and marrying the two of those putting them together right i don't know would i would call that proficient at that stage it could be blurry but I think I think there is going to be a big step wherever that step is, and and like I said, for me, I like to to stick with the apprentice journeyman yeah. master, right? Yep. Yep. Where where that split is is very clean. You're following the recipe with your little you know touches here and there, but when you start merging the different concepts together that you've you've gathered together over your time practicing whatever art you're practicing you can start marrying them and become that kind of, you're creating your own thing at that point. You're not modifying someone else's thing. But there is, I agree with you, a distinct difference when you get to the expert level though. At that level, you don't have to look into the book and ask, all right, how am I, how am I going to char this or what, you know, you know how, you know how all the, everything's going to be married with each other. Everything's going to be paired perfectly as I would, 
keep with the cooking analogy. Everything's going to be paired perfectly. You're going to, you're not going to have to second guess how it's cooked or when it's cooked or how long, or is this too much salt? You, it's, you just know it's subconscious to you at this point. You've done it so many times. You're so familiar with it. You say, all right, it needs more. Did, have you, have you seen the movie knives out yet? I have not yet. Uh uh-uh. Oh, man. Okay, so big spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't seen it. <laughs> you could just stop the podcast right now. But uh, one of one of the plot points is that the the maid um, mistakenly thinks that she uh, injects her client with just a ridiculous amount of morphine, right? Just a just a ridiculous amount of morphine um, because someone had switch the uh, things on her vials the labels yeah the yeah. labels right because she had one vial that she that was innocuous that she gave her client a lot of and then there was a morphine where she's only supposed to give a little of right so she picked up one vial and, and gave him a lot of it looked at the vial and it said morphine right well it's revealed that she had such an intimate knowledge of this that just the slight viscosity difference or the yeah. color difference or whatever in the vial. She, she automatically knew like with all of her other senses that this was the innocuous drug. And then the other thing was the morphine. So she picked up the innocuous one and, and, and gave him that because she had been his caretaker for so long. She had become familiar with that. She was, she was, you know, a, a, a good caretaker at that point because she, she did know about that. And uh, when when someone else had switched the vials, it didn't even face her. But then she looked down at it and had assumed that she had injected him with a whole bunch of morphine because that's what it said on. That's what the label said. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So subconsciously, she was an expert. Like not not even subconsciously, but like muscle memory and and just kind of familiarity with everything you're doing. You you get into a flow, right? I, I've I've stumbled across a. a really excellent freestyle rapper in twitch thug shells i i've just been super impressed the way she just starts to step into a verse and let it lead her she is very solid at her craft and and it is obviously something she's put a lot of practice in and taken ownership of and as she continues to develop that she will gain a feel gain that that flow that je ne sais quoi that you get when you start to become very proficient at something uh, that, that leads you down that path to becoming an expert. And at that point you get to, it's cool because you get to express yourself. You get to put your own spin on something at ma- at that master level, at that master level. Yeah. I would say even at between proficient and expert, I think you're all, you're doing that same thing. You're putting your own spin on it. Yeah, yeah Absolutely. It's a really good feeling when when you have glimpses of that, right? Maybe in her case it was it was a really good set, you know, or or in my roommate's case, that was a that was a really good dish. I did something really right there. Like everything just kind of aligned. I had a really good one off. And and the next one could be, you know, not as good because you're still working your way to that to that expert level, right? Some somehow you got something really well, and that's one of the stepping stones that you get to learn from as you're practicing to get to that expert level. And it feels uh, it feels great. It feels great because you've put in so much practice and so much effort into that and, and, and you pull something off and it's just a sense of a, a sense of wonder really at your own self. You're like, oh, man, I didn't even know I could. I didn't, I, <laughs> How'd I, you know, I had that I in me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any any kind of athlete will, will will tell you the same thing. You know, you, you go hard on, on the practice field and come game day, you're going to have one or two plays that are just really really well done you're in the zone that's a that's a conversation for another day as to you know how how you dial that in but at some point one of the components it does boil down to is simply a lot of practice and taking ownership of the process and you know for for whoever is listening to this you know what whatever you may be whether whether you're that that beginner if you're if you're stepping into something for 2021 right or or if you need to, if you feel yourself needing to break through that mold, you're not the only one. And and if you know someone else who needs to hear this, go ahead and share the link to this episode with them, so we can bring them into these discussions that we have on on productivity and, and open source software and and really just how to how to better ourselves here. Um, now, with that, we hope you enjoyed this episode of our Composecast. Thank you. Be safe, and we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody.